This week, we interview Ferro Mavatuna, CEO of NetSparker, to talk about web application scanning. Apollo joins us in studio to discuss security for startups, and this week's stories include the crowd favorites, WordPress vulnerabilities, and exploiting home routers. So stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails fo flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all your websites, web applications, and web services. Visit them on the web at netsparker.com. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, give the intern control of your botnet. I'm your host. A man who likes glitter, apparently, is what it says <laughs> in the show notes. <laughs> I love glitter. Uh, I'm Paul Sidorian. Welcome to this edition of Security Weekly. I, Apollo is not, he was supposed to be right here. His train is running late. He got delayed, but he will be here to make cocktails with Cuban rum and maybe even bring Cuban cigars, which we obtained absolutely legally, if that's even possible. But he'll be here later. But on the lines via Skype, I want to mention my and uh, introduce my special hosts for this evening. Mr. Carlos Perez from Puerto Rico is here. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Yes. <laughs> wonderful to have you, Carlos, and see you as well. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. uh, to Carlos's right... On Skype, that is, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Welcome, Mike. Always good to be with you, Paul. Mike, we got great feedback from the webcast that we did. We had a good time. I, you are a smart dude. I can't get around that. I, uh, my whole job at that was just to find funny pictures to put in your slides. <laughs> That's, you all nice job with it. That's all I did. That's all I did. I liked it. That's all I did. No, we had a we had a good time. <laughs> it was it was great. Here's what I liked. It was good feedback. It was a. Uh, I thought you and I had a good conversation. We got to share some stuff that people really enjoyed, and uh, and I, my head is swimming with ideas for where we can go next. So yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing what other people want to do. And people are really looking forward to the next uh, installments of those. So look for those coming soon. If you did attend that webcast, I am working on getting the audio, video, and slides posted. So I sent that to a few people, but I will be publishing that. So stay tuned. Um, I want to mention Black Hat, of course running a class there called Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us. You want to learn combat firmware analysis? This is the class for you. It's a two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, and access to the Black Hat Briefings, Business Hall Sponsor Workshops, and Sponsor Sessions, and Arsenal Talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. Kind of interesting and timely. Uh, I noticed that I got a few more registrations for the class. There's just tons of news about security in the Internet of Things and routers. We're going to talk about a story where there was 60 yep. vulnerabilities found in maybe two dozen mm -hmm. different kinds of routers. So that trend seems to be continuing. And, of course, we're going to talk about it at nauseum again because that's what we do. Um, I want to introduce, introduce our special guest for this evening, Ferro Mavatuna, who is the CEO and product architect at NetSpark, who's been working in the application security industry for well over a decade, and his ambition is to ease the process of automatically detecting web application vulnerabilities, which led him to NetSparker and pursued it to the point of a commercial reality. Ferro is also next, uh, well, I said that, you're the product architect. Ferro, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Paul. Hi. <laughs> so, Farrell, how did you get your start in information security? Oh, uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. I think I was in high school and, you know, I was one of those guys who's been playing with computer all the time. And one of my friends just out of the blue called me and he told me, you know what, you develop web applications, you develop websites. And you know what, apparently they hacked these websites and there is this website and it's just one random underground website talking about hacking. And I'm like, okay, this sounds interesting. And I think it took me like a couple of days looking into that. And I, I started to enjoy it and see what I can hack, what I can do, you know, all of the things. And 
thinking this was back in almost like 2002, 2003, it was like wide open. So you can go anywhere and hack anything and everything was effectively vulnerable. <laughs> So it's the same as it is today, then, with web application security, right? <laughs> well, uh, I think it would be quite unfair, you know. It's like the back in the day, you, you didn't have even firewalls. Imagine the same amount of web applications right. without even the basic checks and stuff or no distance frameworks around. Uh, Farrell, what's your opinion on web application firewalls? I think when you and I spoke earlier, I think we kind of have the same opinion of web application firewalls. It's, it's one of those things you want to have, but it's, it's, it's not going to solve anything. It's defense in depth approach <laughs> in my idea. So it's not going to solve anything, but it's like to be had it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, they really block kind of the low hanging fruit, but my issue with them is they don't solve the underlying problems. Correct, yeah. I think it's good you might defect some common problems and stuff, or a, an attacker can look into something and they might like, okay, you know, it's going to take longer than I thought, I'm just going to give up. Right, right. But it, on the other hand, we know for a fact from the history that every single web application firewall, given the enough amount of time, will be bypassed for a certain attack. Yep, fair enough. Um, and now, speaking of fixing the underlying problem, you know, obviously your product detects uh, problems. Right. But what I noticed with your product, um, and I, I have used NetSpark, in fact, we still use it uh, uh, to this day, um, there's a lot of focus on the workflow that happens once you discover a vulnerability. Did, did you do that on purpose? Is that, you know, what's the philosophy behind, uh, I, 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 you can confirm, I firmly believe you put a lot of effort into that area of it. Right, you, you're talking about the solving the issue, right? How to solve it or... Yeah, well, and inside your, your own product, you can, you know, create tasks and hold people oh, right, accountable right. to those vulnerabilities and retest right, them very yeah. easily. Yeah, yeah, the idea is, you know, in practice, I spend quite a bit of time in pen testing myself. So, you know, when you pen test a website and when you deal with developers and when you talk with them like, okay, fix this, fix that, you get these routine problems. I mean, one of the problems, for example, you say, you got this particular vulnerability and they say, no, we don't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, until you actually exploit it and get the data in front of them, that will be back and forth discussion. So which, what we try to do in the product, we try to solve all the common problems. One of them is this, you know, if there's a vulnerability, we deliver the proof of concept. You know, we do our best to do that. If it's a SQL injection, we will tell you, okay, here is your data from your database. So you don't have to, you know, fight with your developer to prove that the vulnerability exists. The same idea with the workflow, as you said. For example, again and again, what we have seen, you report a vulnerability to, to developers. Then they fix it, they may not fix it. They fix it, they get back to you, and you see, okay, it's not actually fixed. It's a, it's a broken fix. They just blacklisted some character that you use. Mm -hmm. Then you use another character, it, it again works. The same idea then, you know, it, it's one of the problems. Another problem is, like, two months down the line, you do another test, and the very same vulnerability just came back. It revived. Mm -hmm. So what it's right to do, you know, put all this stuff into the workflow, in an automated fashion. So developer, developer has to fix it, and when they don't, it will just come back to them automatically. Okay, this has not been fixed, or this is revived again. You know, it wasn't that. Maybe you rolled back a, a commit or something. We don't know, you know, because the idea is regression testing needs to be part of security testing, as I believe it. Mm. No, that's, a, that's an excellent point and something we often don't talk about as much as we should in when we talk about a secure SDLC is that <laughs> regression testing as they make changes uh, to do that and, and make sure they test for security. So, Ferro, tell me about the, uh, the research that you do to actually develop the checks because you have a pretty comprehensive set of web application security okay. tests. So what, what kind of research goes into uh, going from you know, d uh, discovering those checks all the way to getting them into the product? Right, right. Um, it depends on the vulnerability kind. For example, uh, if, you go, if you go to the basics like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, stuff that you kind of have to have and that's like the first thing you do in a web app scanner, those are generally a lot of experience 
like, okay, you know, I've got all these problems in the past and we have seen all these, but more than that, we approach the problem in a more methodological manner. So we don't say there's a SQL injection and, you know, there is, there is this string, there is this integer. We don't do that. What we do, we try to method, you know, uh, in a methodological way, we try to say, okay, any SQL injection can be in like four or five or whatever in different places in a SQL sentence. You know, it can be... Uh, within quotes, within double quotes, or it can be within a stored procedure, blah, blah, blah. It can be in the beginning, it can be at, at the end, after the order by, whatever. And then we say it can be integer or string, or it can be byte, binary, whatever. And then it can be Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et so at the end of the day, we end up like 500 test cases just for SQL injection checks, or even more. You know, it's it's interesting yep. you say that, Farrell, because in, well, I just you know came off of a, a big project in web application scanning, and right. some people were asking me because now I'm like the resident expert for web app scanning, all of a sudden, and <laughs> the, but people ask me, you know, it seems like we can find in uh, cross-site scripting and other kinds of injection flaws more easily than we can find SQL injection. Right. And what I tell them is along the lines of what you were just saying is that SQL injection is very specific to the database server that's being run. It's specific to the configuration, like you mentioned, stored procedures. Right. It can even be specific to the uh, application server. So while you have one SQL injection flow, like you said, there's 500 different iterations to exactly. handle all the different use cases. I mean, with cross-site scripting, it depends so much less on that back-end system. So do you find yourself spending more time developing those SQL injection checks than the cross-site scripting or other types of injection? I think nowadays... To be, to be fair, we haven't touched our SQL injection engine in an extensive manner for maybe even for maybe more than a year. Mm -hmm. Mostly because that was the first thing we got right. Right, And right. at the time, we spent quite a bit of time, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I said, you create all these test cases and all the, these edge cases. And even then, you know, in real world, you see even more edge cases. Like you say, okay, there's a SQL injection, but to able to exploit it, you got to bypass this blacklist, or you got to bypass that web application firewall, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, nowadays, when it comes to cross-site scripting, the more challenging task, not the detecting, you know, classical reflectors cross-site scripting, or even stored for that matter, but the new thing, you know, DOM-based cross-site scripting, you know, proved to be quite challenging because... Mm. It might even require you do the attack, and then you you have to interact with the page to trigger the attack to see it actually worked on the you know document object model level. Yeah, and uh, I find that, uh, and I don't know if you found this to be true as well, that web browsers today are more sensitive to cross-site scripting and will actually block those attacks from happening. <laughs> I think you're right. Also, I don't know how many we have seen. I think at least three or four vulnerabilities in web browsers, cross-site scripting blocking implementations themselves. Oh, <laughs> interesting. It's that whole, yeah. So, yeah I don't, I don't like, want viruses, so I put antivirus software, but my antivirus right. software introduces vulnerabilities. It's like that same kind of thing. That's very interesting. I didn't exactly. know that. Exactly. Or your file will introduce a vulnerability, which defeats the yeah. whole purpose yeah. kind of situation. Now, Ferro, your uh, claim is the false positive free web right. application scanner. That's obviously a pretty bold statement. I've been in the vulnerability scanning market for a long time. Uh, I know how difficult it is to, to live up to that claim. So what are some of the things you do um, to be able to provide a false positive free application scanner? Right, right. Uh, the approach we took is completely based on exploitation. You know, one, one thing to make, you know, I need to make something clear because every time I talk about web application security and exploitation, then people get scared because, you know, they yeah. need to think about mostly, you know, different kind of exploitations or thinking from a network security point of view. Because in network security, you know, you don't, you don't go around and exploit buffer overflows to prove a vulnerability. That will be insane. That will bring down so many systems down, right? It definitely has but, that potential, right? A, a buffer overflow yeah. exploit I describe as a controlled crash on the system. I think it was Ed Scotus that described it to me that way, which really kind of fit why uh, that can cause adverse reactions in your systems. But web apps are different, right? 
Correct. So in web apps, if you are actually scanning for something, it's not much different than a safe way to exploit stuff. So, you know, if they are going to crash, they are going to crash when you are scanning them anyway. So mm -hmm. there is no extra disadvantage exploiting something. So our approach to false positive problem is quite simple. You know, as a pen tester, what you do, when you find a vulnerability, when your tool tells you there is a vulnerability, the next thing you do, you go ahead and exploit it. You know, because that's how you prove stuff. And that makes sense. So we told, if that's the way, we can do that automatically as well. So first detect the vulnerability, then exploit it, and tell the user, okay, I've successfully exploited this problem, therefore it cannot be a false positive, and it will be reported as confirmed. Having said that, you know, there are cases we won't, you know, the tool won't able to confirm the vulnerability, won't able to find the correct payload to exploit the vulnerability, then it will go back to the user and say, look, I found this problem, I couldn't get it done, you know, I couldn't exploit it, so I, I will dump it to you. So you will right. still have that vulnerability, but at the end of the day, out of 20 issues, you will know 18 of them are confirmed, and two of them you have to, you know, double check. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you know, that's, that's the approach, really. Basically, we developed an exploitation engine for every single vulnerability with an impact. If it's a local file inclusion, we will steal etc password. If it's a SQL, you know, if it's a SQL injection, we will get the database version or you know something like that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, Farrow, you your company Netsparker started out with just a, a Windows only web application scanning client. And then at some point, you built a cloud application. What was it like making the transition from the Windows-based technology and putting that technology in the cloud? Right. It's, actually, there's a little bit funny story in that. When I first started the company, I actually, you know, I was going to do a software as a service business. So I never meant it to be a Windows client application. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was my first demo, and then, you know, it just happened, kind of. So five years down the line, after we, you know, set up the company earlier this year, um, we developed the cloud version. Technically, it was rather easy. The reason being, you know, we are on .NET technology stack. And one of the biggest advantages of .NET, you can use the very same code base as a separate DLL in multiple platforms. And so, you know, your web interface will talk with the very same library that you use on your Windows desktop, which can be done in other technologies as well. But in that, that is a very straightforward process. So that's what we kind of used. And on top of that, we just added, you know, uh, with a new team, a uh, web user interface and all the scalability engines and all that. So it was actually much easier than hmm. maybe it seems. Right. <laughs> Farrell, I tend to break up web application scanning into three different categories. And a lot of people, again, will come to me with questions about web application scanning. And when they ask that question, I almost make them take a step back and ask them what their goals are. And I feel like that there's the expert penetration tester who's probably going to use your client, you know, Windows client-based technology. And it's a one-to-one -one relationship with a human to a web application. Now, obviously, that doesn't scale. So I kind of put this second classification where you have some users that are pretty savvy about what applications they have and how to tune a scanner to a certain degree for those applications. And they be maybe scanning a couple of dozen applications. And then there's a third category where you go, I, I don't know where all my web apps are. I don't really know much about my web apps. I just want to scan everything. I, I mean, do you agree with those kind of three classifications? Has that been your experience? And how do you advise people on their web application scanning strategies? No, that's, that's pretty much what we hear all the time, really. Mm. And as you said, for example, we got pen, you know, customers as pen testing companies, and that's, that's what they like. They, they want to use the tool. They want to see the, all the details, all the traffic. Mm -hmm. And for example, we have interactive exploitation tools as well, post-exploitation. So you know, when you find a vulnerability in that spark, then you can go ahead and further exploit it. To, to give you an example, let's say it found a local file inclusion, so you can read files from the web server. Then there is a tool, since the NetSpark knows all the site map, site map uh, there is a tool which you can say, okay, download all of the source codes. Mm. And it will just go ahead and download it. So those are the pen testers. Then, as you said, you move to the more cloud-based customers. 
you know, they don't want details. They don't want, you know, sit on, on a screen and wait for the results or right. watch the scan or whatever. What they want, okay, I've got 10 websites, get it scanned every week. And if there is a vulnerability set, you know, tell me. Mm-hmm. And then the last category is, is the most interesting one, maybe. I want security, but I know I don't know. I got so many stuff. Just find right. out and fix them. Yeah, like I want to give you a subnet, and then I want you to <laughs> yeah. scan the whole <laughs> thing and all the web applications and tell me what's wrong. And I don't want to give you any intelligence about what the authentication is, what the rewrite right. rules right. might be, or what the you know, 404 pages are. Like I don't want to give you anything. I just want you to automatically scan it. And the fact is, many of them, they don't have that inventory anyway. Even if they want to, they couldn't give it to you because they don't have it. They got like right. so many stuff installed on their network and they're just there. And in web app scanning, it's even harder to get there because, you know, sometimes you hit a web server and you just have the IP address, but you don't have the domain name. If it's exactly. not OpenSSL valid certificate or anything, you don't have any clue. So, you know, you just hit a bad host name error message or something, mm -hmm. and you just missed a web application. Or you missed 10 web applications, right? right. They were virtually yeah. hosted on yeah. that IP address. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what I try and explain to people. It seems like people are at different stages of maturity when it comes to web application scanning. I think it's gotten a lot better over time, but I still think there's people in, in camps that don't have a full understanding of, you know, you probably need all three approaches is, is at the end of the day what I recommend to people. Like if you have that one business critical application, you probably want to be doing a lot of heavy pen testing on that and have a one-to-one -one relationship with it. You probably want to be doing the second scenario where you're providing uh, more details to a larger, slightly larger number of applications. And then you probably want to be scanning for everything to tell you about the stuff you don't know about. Right. Yeah. Also... A common approach, and it just makes sense, you can, you know, set aside your mission-critical website, you know, the stuff that you have to secure all the way. And then you can say, okay, also I've got this bunch of stuff, there is no real super important data in them, but obviously I, I still don't want them to be get hacked or anything. Right, right. So that's another option. And when it comes to, you know, you mentioned that, this, you know, if you have this one big website that is super important for you, if you're a bank or something, mm then scanning can get complicated. So, you know, you can go as deep as you can. You can actually do the scan and say, has it found everything? Maybe it hasn't because it's never been linked from anywhere and it cannot be brute force. It's not a common word or something, a particular page. So you can even do, okay, then I'm going to supply those missing pages mm -hmm. to the scanner and do a, a better scan. Or if you got a URL rewrite, okay, I can let the scanner decide what URL rewrite is, but I can also give it, and it will be more precise. So the more you configure, the better it will work. And when it works, you got options to check whether it worked correctly or not. Mm -hmm. But obviously this takes time, and sometimes it takes some technical understanding of what is going on, and, you know, it's not scalable. Yeah, <laughs> it's not scalable. yeah and authentication it's is one of those things in web application scanning that's very unique. Uh, yeah. How did you approach the authentication problem? Like, I, I can scan my web application, but if it doesn't have a user account, it's really not going to see anything. So how right. do you deal with that? Because there's so many different ways to authenticate to a web app. <laughs> it's, it's literally the biggest problem we had since the beginning of the product. So authentication was always, you know, always a huge pain. So actually about three months ago, we started more than three months ago, but we spent about six months completely rewriting our authentication. And, the, you know, as you said, there is single sign-on, there are two-factor authentication, mm -hmm. there are captchas, there are like three pages of authentications, all the crazy stuff. So you got to support every single one of them, but it's super complicated. So mm -hmm. the final solution we had, and so far it's very good. And, you know, we do our tests like, okay, let's grab 100 websites and test our authentication on them. Also, just go back to all of the customers having problems with current authentication and see if it fixes the problem, kind of. So the current solution we had is completely in document, you know, DOM level. So the before that, we were like, okay, we watch the traffic, we repeat the traffic. But in practice, it's much more complicated. You want to execute the JavaScript. You want to simulate everything mm -hmm. just like a real browser. Right. So the final solution we had, you type your username and password, 
And then you say, okay, this is my login page. Then we will figure out. We will figure out the right input and write everything from the, on the JavaScript level, on the DOM level. And then the tool will repeat everything. It just works. And when it doesn't work, this is the tricky part. We solved that problem in a much simpler level. We said, look, you know, people scanning this website, people configuring this authentication, either developers or pen testers. But nonetheless, they will understand JavaScript in the basic level. So what we did, okay, you know, now you can script in JavaScript to address all the complicated issues. Mm. Let's say, you know, it didn't find the right input. You can tell, okay, this is the input. It didn't click somewhere. You can say, this is, this is the click. Or you can just right click and say, okay, this is my input. Or right click, okay, click here. So it will capture it and it will repeat it uh, to log in. And when you log out, it will repeat it again. But it's... it's Maybe the most challenging part of scanning. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Mike or Carlos, uh, I know I, I covered a lot of ground with Ferro. Uh, I wanted to turn over to you guys to see if you had uh, questions for Ferro or questions about web application scanning. Sorry, I put um, you on the spot, I know. Not, not on my side. I'm not that good at web apps. <laughs> oh, Carlos. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not buying that, man. Uh, yeah, I don't buy that either. <laughs> yeah, I, I got an education there, guys. To be fair. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. So, Farrow, what is uh, coming out next uh, for NetSparker? Like, what are the, what uh, features have you recently released, or some, maybe some of the ones that you're working on? Right. Um, as I said, we, we revamped our authentication, so it's completely new. You know, that was something new. And we're constantly adding new vulnerabilities. Um, for example, recently we have been adding some new bypasses in, uh, let me think, in cross-site scripting, if I'm not mistaken. And the cloud is pretty much a focus right now, so we are adding lots of features to the cloud. Well, you know, you mentioned workflow, like whether, you know, you can find a vulnerability and assign it to someone and they will be responsible and all that workflow. And another thing we are really working on, I mentioned, you know, uh, the, you know, DOM and the modern web applications. Now we are trying to support single page applications better. You already do support, but if you, if you think about single page applications, they are super complicated. Mm. Imagine Gmail. So Chrome Gmail is, is a hell of a job. So you can find everything, but the problem is certain things can only be found if you follow an order. Right. Like you have to click left, compose, then you have to click a button, then you need to choose yes. And if you don't do that, any of the steps you miss, the document object model will be different, and the page will be different, then you, you will miss stuff. Mm. So that's, that's one of the problems we are trying to solve now. Another thing is upcoming in the next release is automatic URL rewrite support. We already support you know, a detecting URL rewrite automatically. But it's limited. Right now, it figures out there's a URL rewrite. Then it kind of doesn't collect more than X amount of samples, let's say 20, because you know, it will be the same thing. Now, unless you tell it where your URL, URL right. rewrites are, which right. actually was something that support helped us with one of our websites that we were scanning, has a ton of rewrites. And they're like, no, you need to you know, do all the stuff. And they were actually very helpful in, in helping us define what those were to help our scans. Uh, it cut our scan times down by two or three times at least. How, how do you handle those websites, let's say like PHP admin and those websites where there's a danger where you probably can get into an administrative interface that says drop database, you <laughs> click on it, and then are you sure you click yes and you drop a database? Good question, Carlos. Well, that danger is that, you know, we don't, we don't try to protect against it. You know, we, we tell the user, look, when you run this, it will click everything. It will, it will do everything a user can do. Not will do, but can do. So if you let it log in to your PHP admin as a privileged user, it will do everything. It will drop databases or if you... You know, if you give it to your contact page, which sends an email without mm -hmm. any limitations, yes, it will send you 1,500 emails. <laughs> so it's, it's just okay. the way it But is. now that's, that's one thing that you tune when you do web application scanning, right. especially with credentials, is you tell it what pages not to go to. Right. And I always, you know, you have to do a staging area. You have to spend the time and say, 
and define what pages it shouldn't click on uh, and then run it. Because I've dropped my share of databases doing web application scanning and learned the hard way <laughs> that that's <laughs> the way it works. But you can specify, uh, an ex is it a, a regex for an exclude list uh, in, in the product? Yeah, yeah. We, do, we do support regex. Also, what you can do after crawl, you can pause it. And from the sitemap, you can right click, say, don't, don't mm -hmm. touch this, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't touch these parameters, don't touch these pages, don't touch these regexes. You know, so it's very very granular because it's it's super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, well, that not only does that help with uh, making sure you don't drop a database accidentally, but it also helps speed up the scan. Oftentimes, right. application servers, you know, let's say they've got, uh, you know, a couple of dozen pages that are documentation, but because of the way the language works, even those static pages could take parameters that you don't care about. I mean, the parameters don't do anything. Uh, so you can exclude, like, huge chunks of the application that you don't care about so that it focuses in on the important stuff. And, and do you have plans, let's say, for some type of automation where let, I can in, uh, probably integrate this into my development life cycle or my DevOps cycle? Let's say if yeah. there's a commit okay. from Git, here's the API for you to interface with it and launch a scan every time X happens. Yeah, uh, what we do in this is on on Netsparkle Cloud, so we don't have that in Netsparkle Desktop. But on the cloud, you got a really nice, neat REST API where you can do pretty much everything. You can launch a scan, you can see the results, and all that. And we got customers doing integration in two levels. Some of them, you know, uh, working on the API level in a more details. And some of them, this works on desktop as well. You got automation in desktop from command line. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of customers actually using continuous integration systems like TeamCity or Jenkins. And what they do is hooking up their almost like after commit execution. So when, you, when, when one of your developers write a new line of code, it gets deployed, and right after it's deployed, it gets scanned by Netspark when you can do okay. incremental that's scans. Great. And if there's a problem, you get alerted. And you know, that's pretty cool. So as, as long as the vulnerability is introduced, pretty much the very same day, you get a result back, you just introduce a cross-site scripting. Not, not like, you know, you don't have to wait two months down the line for a pen test. You just get that feedback immediately to the developer so they can fix their mistakes and they won't introduce 15 copies by the end of two months, which is the, you know, one week before the release when they get pen tested and stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. that's, that's how it works right now, generally. Now, it's interesting, obviously, NetSparker is a sponsor of the show, but there's a reason for that. I've used a lot of different web application scanning tools. Um, I really liked the NetSparker product, and I said if I was going to use it to secure our websites, I would, I would choose NetSparker. And one of the things I really liked you touched on, Ferro, is the ability to do retesting and do incremental scans. So you run a scan today, finds a bunch of vulnerabilities. I basically assign those all to poor Chris who has a love-hate relationship with NetSparker. He, hate, he <laughs> hates how easy it is for me to assign him work to do. Um, and then, you know, Chris and I will go, mostly Chris, will fix a bunch of stuff. And I can say, well, just go retest those vulnerabilities that you found and do an incremental scan. So it's not doing a full scan. It's only testing for the vulns it found. But you can also do that with individual vulnerabilities as well. You can say, hey, go retest just this one particular vulnerability. I really like that in, in the product. It really helps you get rid of vulnerabilities rather quickly and verify that they're gone. Right. So, Farrow, um are you going to be speaking anywhere soon or at a conference somewhere or? Not anywhere soon. I mean, to be honest with you, for the last couple of years, I haven't been doing so much research deeply, you know, mm. partly because I, I mostly moved to the management level and, you know, overseeing the product and overseeing the security, but that limits your time to do actual research, which mm. is what I was used to do. And that's part of the reason not speaking much uh, yeah, in right. many places recently. Someone's got to run the company, right? Um, <laughs> so are you going to be a black hat? Uh, maybe. It's not definite this year, unfortunately. But, you know, planning to be. <laughs> okay. Well, Vegas is beautiful that time of year, so you should definitely make it. Um, <laughs> I do. Yeah, super hot beat. It's super yeah. hot. <laughs> uh, I have five questions for you. They're five silly questions. Are you ready? Yeah, go. Okay. Three words to describe yourself. Um, 
Geek Husband. Good. <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Well, um, a shank. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Ooh. Um... I hacked your website. <laughs> <laughs> nice. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Uh, third. <laughs> third, okay. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Ooh. Uh, oh, that's hard. That's a tough one. I know. That's the most difficult question we ask in all our interviews. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. They can be alive or dead. They can be a male, female, male, male, female, female. You know, right, it's right, totally right. up to you. Two celebrities to be your parents. Yeah, I will go with Brad Pitt and, you know, uh, Angelina Jolie. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's, that is that's the that's most that's popular <laughs> answer. I don't know why. Someone oh, really? could do a okay. study. It <laughs> is the most popular <laughs> answer. I I don't know why. Um, I think the idea is, if they are your very parents, Freud. you have to be, you know, this handsome, beautiful guy, right? It's true. You know? It's true. A lot of it has to do with looks. So, yes. Excellent. Well, Farrell, thank you very much for your support, and thank you for coming on the show. It was Thanks wonderful so having you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and since Apollo was delayed, we're going to do stories for the week next. So, if you want your WordPress vulnerability and exploiting home routers, Phil... Make sure you stay tuned. So we'll be right back. <laughs> 